This is one of the most fortified border walls anywhere in the world in Gaza. Here's the thing though, it's not a border wall with Israel. In fact, it's Gaza's border wall with Egypt, which they're spending even more money on expanding and fortifying. But why does Egypt, a largely Muslim country, need such a heavily fortified border with Gaza? Well, on top of the conflict on the other side of the border, Egypt and countries like Jordan have a rather hardline stance against accepting Palestinian refugees. The issues of refugees coming to Jordan, and I think I can quite strongly speak on behalf not only of um, 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 uh, Jordan as a nation, but of uh, our friends in Egypt, that is a red line. No refugees in Jordan, no refugees in Egypt. And this stems from rather severe lessons learned in the past few decades where previous influxes of Palestinian refugees and organizations pose considerable challenges to their stability. And in some cases, civil wars from which they still have not recovered today. Many around the world often ask why countries in the Middle East don't do more to take in Palestinians in their own countries. Well, in this video, we're going to be looking at some countries who did just that and experienced severe consequences as a result. Perhaps one of the most well-known examples of this was in Kuwait. Around the time Israel was established in 1948, Kuwait struck oil, leading to a massive economic boom. They had grand plans for development and needed a skilled workforce to make it happen. Palestinians, many of whom were well-educated and skilled, fit this need perfectly and moved to Kuwait in large numbers. Thanks to their significant contributions to Kuwait's development, Palestinians enjoyed unprecedented privileges and rights compared to other Arab countries at the time. The Kuwaiti government welcomed them, providing support in various areas. The Palestinian community thrived in Kuwait, contributing significantly to the country's development while preserving their own cultural identity. However, this all changed in the 1990s. Good evening. It is a prescription for war, this Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the tiny country that is a primary source of oil for much of the Western world. But tonight, the United States, the Soviet Union, Israel, and other powers are concentrating on diplomatic and economic solutions to this surprising and dangerous development. On the 2nd of August in 1990, Saddam Hussein ordered the invasion of Kuwait. The Iraqi military swiftly advanced into Kuwait, overpowering the small Kuwaiti defense forces. Within just two days, Iraqi forces had seized control of Kuwait City and many of the country. The rapid and brutal invasion involved widespread looting, and there were numerous reports of human rights abuses, including summary executions and mass detentions. The international community reacted with immediate and strong condemnation. There is no justification whatsoever for this outrageous and brutal act of aggression. The United Nations Security Council swiftly passed Resolution 660, demanding Iraq's immediate withdrawal from Kuwait. Despite this, Saddam Hussein remained defiant claiming Kuwait as Iraq's 19th province. So how does Palestine play into this? Well, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO, led by Yasser Arafat, controversially decided to support Saddam Hussein's invasion. Just another terrible decision to add to the long list of terrible decisions made by Palestinian leaders, I guess. Well, the stance was driven by several factors, including political alliances and the hope that aligning with Iraq would strengthen the Palestinian position against Israel. Meanwhile, in response to the invasion, the United States led the formation of a broad international coalition to oppose Iraq's aggression. This coalition aimed to enforce the UN's resolutions through both diplomatic and military means if necessary. In a 9,000 IQ strategic move to fracture the coalition, Iraq fired Scud missiles into Israel, hoping to provoke an Israeli retaliation. Saddam Hussein believed that if Israel entered the conflict, Arab countries would be forced to withdraw their support for the coalition. However, Israel, under significant pressure from the United States, chose not to retaliate. This restraint maintained the unity of the coalition and thwarted Saddam's attempt to destabilize their lines. After months of diplomatic efforts failed to persuade Iraq to withdraw, the coalition launched Operation Desert Storm on January 17, 1991. By February 28, just 100 hours after the Grand War began, Kuwait was liberated and a ceasefire was declared. And as president, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated the war is over. So, what happened to the Palestinians living in Kuwait who sided with Saddam? Well, the PLO's support for Iraq led to a severe backlash against them. Kuwaitis saw this as a serious betrayal. And honestly, could you blame them? As a result, 
Between 200,000 to 250,000 Palestinians were expelled from Kuwait. The expulsion was both direct and indirect. The Kuwaiti authorities implemented policies that made life increasingly difficult for Palestinians. These included revoking residency permits, closing Palestinian schools, and terminating employment for Palestinians. Many Palestinians were forced to leave voluntarily due to the hostile environment and the lack of means to sustain themselves. Most of the expelled Palestinians found themselves displaced once again, seeking refuge in countries like Jordan and other neighboring countries. Jordan is another country that experienced a rather dark history with Palestinians. But before we head to Jordan, I need your help to get to my goal of 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So if you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that subscribe button and give it a thumbs up. Pivoting back to Jordan, after the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, a significant number of Palestinian refugees fled to Jordan. The Jordanian government under King Abdullah initially welcomed them. Jordan granted citizenship to many Palestinians, allowing them to integrate more fully into Jordanian society. This move was partly driven by the geopolitical aim of consolidating control over the West Bank, which Jordan annexed in 1950. Following the 1967 Six-Day War, the PLO began to establish a significant presence in Jordan. The PLO under Yasser Arafat operated with considerable autonomy within Jordan, establishing its own military and political infrastructure. They found Jordan to be a strategic location due to its proximity to Israel and the large Palestinian refugee population already present there. The PLO had effectively created a state within a state in Jordan. They also used Jordan as a launching pad for guerrilla attacks against Israel. These operations included cross-border raids, ambushes and acts of sabotage which brought Israeli retaliatory attacks into Jordanian territory. Naturally, this increased pressure on the Jordanian government and put King Hussein in a rather difficult position. The situation escalated as the PLO grew more assertive, challenging Jordanian sovereignty. In fact, it reached a point where they were openly calling to overthrow the Jordanian monarchy. Tensions reached a peak in September 1970 when the PLO hijacked several planes and diverted them to Jordan, demanding the release of Palestinian prisoners. This act of defiance was a final straw for King Hussein. The Jordanian army launched a full-scale assault on the PLO, resulting in a conflict known as Black September. The fighting lasted for about 10 months, causing significant casualties. The aftermath of Black September left a profound impact on Jordan. The conflict severely strained the country's resources and tested the loyalty of its military and citizens. King Hussein's decisive action to expel the PLO was aimed at restoring Jordanian sovereignty and stability, but it also deepened internal divisions. The heavy casualties and destruction from the conflict left scars on Jordanian society, fostering a lingering mistrust between the Jordanian government and the Palestinian population within the country. The Arab world, on the other hand, was also deeply divided over the conflict. Some countries, like Egypt and Syria, were sympathetic to the PLO and condemned Jordan's actions. Others, like Saudi Arabia and Morocco, supported King Hussein's efforts to maintain stability. Israel watched the conflict closely, as it had significant implications for its own security. The expulsion of the PLO from Jordan was seen as a positive development, reducing the immediate threat of cross-border attacks. The United States, under President Richard Nixon, supported King Hussein's efforts to quell the PLO uprising. The US saw the stability of Jordan as crucial to its interests in the Middle East and provided military and economic aid to support the Jordanian government. So, what happened to the PLO? Well, the expulsion from Jordan was a significant setback for them. It lost a major base of operations and many of its fighters were either killed or displaced. The leadership, including Yasser Arafat, were forced to relocate to Lebanon. And that's where we turn our attention to next. Lebanon, perhaps, may have been the worst case of Palestinian influence destabilizing a country. In fact, they've still not recovered today. After being expelled from Jordan, the PLO established a strong military presence in southern Lebanon, using it as a base to launch guerrilla attacks and rocket strikes against Israel. Lebanon's delicate sectarian balance was already strained before the arrival of the PLO. The country's population was divided amongst various religious and ethnic groups, including Maronite Christians, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, and others. The PLO formed alliances with several Lebanese factions, predominantly leftists, no surprises there, and Muslim groups who oppose the Maronite-dominated government. If you want to check out another video I made on the unholy alliance between Islam and the left, you can check it out right here. Pivoting back, 
The PLO's support for these factions provided them with additional military strength and resources, further emboldening their demands and actions against the Maronite-led government and Christian militias. And finally came the Civil War. The PLO's involvement in the conflict with its military capabilities and alliances significantly escalated the violence. Palestinian factions, alongside their Lebanese allies, fought against the Maronite militias and the Lebanese army. The war quickly spread across the country, drawing in various militias, foreign armies and international actors. As the civil war progressed, the PLO's continued attacks on Israel from Lebanese territory provoked even more severe Israeli retaliations. The IDF launched major operations, including Operation Litany in 1978 and the invasion of Lebanon in 1982 aimed at rooting out the PLO and destroying its infrastructure. These operations caused extensive damage, further destabilizing Lebanon and exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. The Lebanese civil war devastated Lebanon in ways that the country has struggled to recover from, even decades later. Conflict destroyed much of the country's infrastructure, including its roads, buildings and essential services. Entire neighborhoods were reduced to rubble and the economy was shattered. The social fabric of Lebanon was torn apart with deep sectarian divides and mistrust lingering long after the fighting stopped. The civil war resulted in approximately 120,000 deaths and displaced hundreds of thousands of people. And of course, new groups also came into being like Hezbollah, an Iranian proxy that to this day continues providing military support for Palestine while attacking Israel. At the time of writing the script, Israel was gearing up to invade southern Lebanon to wage a full-scale war against Hezbollah. Guess history does repeat itself. This terrible history many Arab countries have experienced with the PLO or Palestinian refugees definitely show us why many are quite reluctant to take in a large influx of people in the modern day. In fact, many countries decided to move away from the politics of the 20th century that had led to so much political tension, war and instability in the region. And perhaps rightfully so. The perpetual war against Israel and its allies certainly doesn't bode well for many of these countries, especially the ones trying to impose themselves as popular tourist destinations as they move away from oil-based economies. And this is where I want to introduce you to the Abraham Accords. It represented a landmark shift in Middle Eastern geopolitics, marking the normalization of relations between Israel and several Arab nations. Initiated in 2020, these agreements were brokered by the United States and involved key signatories like the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco. For decades, the Arab-Israeli conflict defined the region's political landscape, with most Arab countries refusing to recognize Israel. These accords signaled a shift from pan-Arabism to a more nationalist and strategic approach, focusing on economic growth and regional stability. The participating Arab countries prioritized their national interests and development over the long-standing ideological opposition to Israel. But perhaps the biggest part of this was progress towards including Saudi Arabia in these accords. It would have signaled significant change in the Middle East. The Saudis wanted military assurances, nuclear technology and more from the United States in exchange for normalizing relations with Israel. Unfortunately, this was seen as a threat to Iran who would have suddenly found themselves alone against countries that normalize relations with Israel. And this obviously was unacceptable to them. As negotiations were ongoing in 2023 with Saudi Arabia, Iran's proxy, Hamas, carried out the October 7 attacks. And you know the aftermath. A huge regression in a path that could have led to a more peaceful future for all of these countries, and perhaps a better future for the Palestinians as well. Away from traditional, violent ideologies held by their leaders. Looking forward, the path to peace in the Middle East remains fraught with challenges. Potential inclusion of Saudi Arabia in the Abraham Accords could still represent a significant step towards a more stable and prosperous region. However, achieving this will require navigating the complex interplay of regional rivalries, internal political dynamics and the broader geopolitical landscape, and perhaps more importantly, a change in the psyche of people across the region. And honestly, the growth of secularism or even moving away from hardline Islamic ideology may also help. The petrol war doesn't benefit anybody. So, what did you think? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, please remember to subscribe and hit that like button. I've got plenty more content just like this on my channel, so go check them out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.